Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reimagine 2021, the virtual conference series. I'm your co-host, Ashley Meredith, Head of Education at Mousebelt Blockchain Accelerator. And today we're bringing you version 8.0, State of the Art Chain. Uh, we'll be bringing you all the latest news and updates about exciting use cases like NFTs, art, gaming, music on the blockchain. Uh, these these uh, new innovations that are bringing new users into the space and contributing to more adoption and hype. Uh, around blockchain technology. And today I'm here with Jonathan Lapchik. He's the CEO of Suku. It's a platform that's linking open finance, traceability, and transparency. Jonathan, how are you doing today? Hey, how are you? Hey, Ashley, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. So for anyone just tuning in, um, Jonathan has been on Reimagine 2020 before. Check out our YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button, and, and see all of the great interviews we have with people working in the world of uh, traceability, NFTs. Uh, Jonathan, tell us what's going on with Suku. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot going on. Um, the, the team is, is extremely busy uh, building some cool stuff. We've been in, in this space for, for uh, almost four years already uh, as with, with Suku. And then we, we had these two part of the business with like the first one that really addresses the need of transparency and traceability um, for, for assets. So you have like shoes and then you want to tell the story of how the shoe is manufactured. And then the second part of the business is that the authenticity part, like how do you prove that the shoe is not only um, sustainable or use the good practices and how the shoe was manufactured, but also if it's authentic. So that's the first thing that users today wanna wanna verify. And so we've been building that second part of the business for for quite some time. And we are excited to bring uh, really cool products to to the market in, in the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. So for anyone who didn't catch your first reimagine interview, uh, how did Suku get started? What was the original uh, use case? So we come from the Deloitte blockchain lab. Uh, we've been in uh, New York building and, and educating clients into what was blockchain since 2014. Um, and back then it was, hey, this is blockchain. This is what can do for your business. And okay, I like it. Let's explore these different use cases. And you build some prototypes and then some solutions. I've been on that role for four years as a product lead. And then at the end of 2017, I met my last client. I was leaving the firm and we were helping them design this part of the business, which is the traceability part, the supply chain, how you connect physical assets with every single input on the chain. And seven of us left the lab to join Suku. So we've been working on that physical to digital for a while to create the traceability and allow brands to become more transparent. And at some point, like we've been working with, with tags and with NFCs and RFIDs through our partner, Avery Dennison. And so that's where we started discovering the potential around connecting physical items with what we call now the metaverse, right? That the entire world lives in one reality and then there's another part of the world that it lives in another and at some point they connect with each other and that's what we create the connection between those two worlds and with covid i think covid uh, magnified that a lot and we've seen that through fashion and and different verticals that really needed that virtual presence and the connection with with the physical to enable different capabilities and different functions that that really create a lot of value for, for the ecosystem. Yeah, as we uh, increasingly find ourselves living in a digital world, uh, there's gonna be new ways to interact with the brands that we like, the objects that are in the physical world. Can we digitize them in some way? Uh, and, and for anyone who might be listening on the podcast, uh, Jonathan brought a prop. What is your prop? <laughs> <laughs> no, the prop is a, is a shoe. So this is an infinite shoe. So infinite is the part of the business that we call it the authenticity part. Um, we call it infinite because it has a different branding and a different audience. Um, and so the, the idea was, if you take a look at the sneakers market, if you think of authentication, you have these secondary marketplaces that really their value is on taking one sneaker that you want to sell and then looking at it and say, okay, this is authentic. I can now sell it to you. And you as a buyer will go to the platform because you trust them 
and you think, I mean, they're providing something that you don't have, which is an authenticity uh, verification. What happens is that many of those buyers really don't use sneakers. So they're really just spending time on shipping, uh, on fees for verification. And the only thing that they do is just they leave them on the closet on then they resell it or they brag about them on social media, right? And, and what we said is, okay, we, we are creating a different way for authentication. So we created these cool stickers, which are tags that we've been designing this for, for a while, for 11 months that go into the sneakers and you create this digital title for the shoe. So you can always know who's the owner and they can transfer ownerships. Like why, if you can own a title for a car that that's worth $20,000, why can, can't you do that for assets that might be worth the same? So we created this new concept of digital titles with a tag that it's tamper proof. So if you remove it and you try to put it on another shoe, it's going to break the circuit. And then creating that title, <clears throat> and we, we, we released that last year uh, through an app. And, and the app, when you see the closet of the items that you have in your real closet, those are represented as NFTs. Um, and so that's where like clients and users started telling us like, yeah, I want to have my physical shoes on my virtual closet as NFTs, but you know, I also want to own purely digital sneakers because if I'm not using the sneakers and I'm not, I'm just reselling them. Like I can just, <laughs> you can just create a digital sneaker that is the same value. And I don't need to deal with authentication, with shipping, with fees whatsoever. And that's where we decided to expand the, the sneaker vertical, um, in, in form of physical assets into purely digital ones. So now we are launching this, this cool marketplace that will sell digital sneakers and also sneakers, I mean, physical sneakers that are sold as NFTs. So you can trade the NFTs and then redeem them for physical. And really that applies to different verticals, handbags, fine art, everything that really has a connection between the physical world that needs to be authenticated and something that needs liquidity from an NFT perspective. So really excited about, about that. There are a lot of different collaborations and, and different um, opportunities that are coming out of, out of that product. Absolutely. So you mentioned like having a title for a car. Before we dive into you know, the blockchain component and how you're issuing these NFTs, uh, just want to give our viewers some more background into the market for authenticated luxury goods or um, specific brands or what is, I'll ask one question, what is the most expensive sneaker you've seen be sold? Uh, I think there's the uh, Michael Jordan, the, the MJ1, the, the first one, I think that he... No, I think it was the last one he used on, um, on his, last, his last game. I think it was like 600K. That's, yeah. probably, that's, that's probably the most expensive one. But then we've seen like collaborations between Christian Dior and, and Nike. I mean, those were, I mean, I think those were like $25,000. Probably they're now like 15. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of <clears throat> luxury items that really need that authentication party that middleman to prove that something is, is authentic. And a lot of different brands capitalize on that need of trust. Uh, so you have the real, real, a public company that really have been like managing these consignment processes where you will give them the, your luxury items and they will sell it for you and, and really matches the needs from the buyers because they need a platform where they can actually buy authentic products. We've seen now eBay, um, bringing different authentication teams. They started with sneakers. Now they're doing it with handbags. They're doing it with watches. And you have the sneaker space, I mean, really exploded a couple of years ago with StockX, Stadium Goods, Goat. It's, it's amazing the, the secondary market that these guys are, were able to create. And we are a technology provider trying to enhance those authentication processes and creating this digital, digital title for, for those brands. Yeah, so... Obviously, if you're going to be spending upwards of $25,000 on a pair of authentic shoes, you want to guarantee that they are authentic. And so am I correct in uh, saying that 
eBay has marketplaces where you would send your goods to them, they authenticate them, and then they, then uh, users can buy it from that marketplace. Exactly. Exactly. The problem is that with eBay and other, and other marketplaces, they will give you the sneaker with this ugly rounded um, tag. And the first thing that if you're buying a thousand dollar sneaker, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to break the tag, right? Unless you have an off white, which is cool, keeping the tags on. Um, but in the majority of the cases, and we got the number, only 3% of the sneakers heads will keep the tags on. And so what happens if you want to then resell it again. So you need to ship it again to, to eBay, then authenticate it again, or you want to sell it to someone else, like outside of another marketplace. So imagine you are looking for a shoe that I just bought from sneaker from, uh, from eBay, and then I sold it to someone, and eBay doesn't have any supply, right? So how do you reach out to the person that I sold it, right? And that's what we create, a way to always being able to reach out to whoever was authenticated, to whoever really owns it, because the, the tag that goes into the shoe um, will have that information. And every time that you transfer the ownership, you know who has it. And so it's we call it infinite because it creates an infinite marketplace where you can reach out to every single product that everyone owns. And at, at some point, you can actually access any product that you want uh, if, uh, if, if you provide the right price. So you might get a notification from... Um, someone that wants to buy your your sneakers that have been in the closet for two years and you didn't know the were those were not for sale so it's like consignment on asteroids because everything that you buy are automatically for sale without you even knowing and they just receive a notification say hey there's someone that wants to buy your sneaker are you interested so you create those dynamics just because you have this title of ownership that that's immutable and that hopefully lives forever yeah, and I think people are always thinking uh, nowadays about how they can uh, kind of pa passive income or increase their wealth or make their money work for them. So if you have a bunch of valuable sneakers sitting in your closet, what a value add is that to not have to think about selling it, but you know, know that if somebody does, if there is a market for it, if someone does want that particular sneaker, they'll be able to reach out to you. So there's two different technologies we're talking about now here. Um, the NF, uh, the RFID kind of chip that's in the shoe. And this is something that us at the Mousebelt team are always interested in talking about and thinking about. Uh, we had a startup in the past that did RFID tracking for sporting uh, events. So time tracking for events, um, moved into the document tracking events, you know, everybody now kind of is more familiar because at festivals you get your wristband and you can scan in and now they're starting to load credit cards onto them. So uh, we've been really excited to see how is IOT, Internet of Things, RFID kind of going to be uh, integrated with blockchain. Um, so tell, tell the viewers more about why you decided to go with RFID, how you developed these stickers and the, the, the tamper proof nature of them. Yeah. So great, great question. I think when we started looking at the market, we've seen everything that we were connecting on the physical world needed to have a match, uh, on, on the digital side. And so if I want to sell you, let's say you want to sell, uh, Tom Brady's first helmet, like the first helmet that he used on, on a game. And you're, you want to sell that as an NFT because our, our tags, our NFC tags really create that link between the physical item and the NFT side. And so how do you really point out and say, that's the item that I'm buying, right? Because someone will say, hey, eBay will come in and say, okay, that's the item that you're buying, perfect. Now, how we can keep track of that? If you're going to sell it when I receive it, right? I bought it as an NFT and then I click on redeem it and I receive it. How do I verify that that's the helmet, right? And so if you are trying to bridge the gap between the digital world, whatever you do in the digital world to mimic the physical world, you needed an asset that it's immutable, that really creates that link. And the tags that, that we design are impossible to clone, right? Um, if you remove them, they're, they're going to break. And so that was, that was the way that we found to actually create and say, yes, that's the asset that I bought 
I'm, I'm certain that that's the one that they, they sold me. Um, and that's the one that links to the NFT that we have without this kind of device. It's impossible to bring, not impossible. It's very difficult to bring physical assets to sell them as, as NFTs into the, the virtual world. Right. Do you see this being a solution for a lot? So of other kinds of items yeah. we're doing this conference kind of around the nft boom calling it state of the art chain um i think a lot of news has and hype has been driven around these digital art pieces that are selling for a ton of money they have no link to the physical world uh do you see the exactly. future of nfts being uh you know some kind of rfid sticker on an actual like uh fr frame on a piece of art or or things like that what, what's your vision of uh yeah. Yeah, we're oh, doing that. Outside of sneakers, right? Yeah, we're, we're doing that with, with fine art. Um, mm -hmm. there, there was a case, I think there was a Warhol painting. No, a Warhol uh, photo that was that was sold a couple of weeks ago. And they were selling you this NFT of the photo. And then I think, I don't, I don't know, I don't think they were shipping the photo. But if, if they were shipping the photo at one point, how do you know that's the photo, right? Or how do you really create this link between the photo that the owner has and the NFT that, that you sold? And, and that, that's the, the explanation. I mean, the, the reason why we created it is that you can actually create that link. And now we are putting stickers into fine art and then those are NFTs already. Those are embedded into the tag, into the metadata. Um, they're signed and so when you sell the, the, NF, the NFT, you know you're buying the physical and you know who's transferring the ownership of the physical. So there are a lot of cool, cool plays there. Like you can sell the digital NFT only and you will have two owners, one for the physical painting, one for the digital painting. Or you can sell the NFT that represents the physical painting, right? So I, I sell it to you, Ashley. I have this hundred million dollar Picasso and I sell it to you. I have a, have a sticker on it and then I sell it to you and you buy the NFT. But then you say, you know what? I don't want to redeem it. I don't want to have, I don't want to have it at my place. So I want to sell it. And then you sell it to someone and then someone to someone else. And at some point say, Hey, yeah, I, I want to have it um, in my room. And then we'll, they will redeem it. And they will always know that the NFT they have matches the tag that that was on on the physical painting when they check and when they go through the through the scanning with with the app so that's i think that that's pretty cool and that's how we are going through different galleries and, and companies that want to bring these these assets uh, into the nft space and now that you're kind of dipping your toes into the fine art world uh something that i've always kind of kept an eye on and been interested in is like multi-fractured ownership of like an entire collection or one piece of art, or is there some way that um, I can prove ownership or even timeshare, like a gallery could own, you know, this collection for the six months that they're going to be showing them. Uh, have you talked to many artists or, or gallerists or, uh, you know, art directors about what they think the future of NFTs, RFID and blockchain is for fine art? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting because they are now realizing that they they have a they have a play. They don't know which one is it yet. Um, I think we we came up with a with a good solution with uh, which is this concept of additions. I don't know if if you know like if you have I don't know you had a Warhol and then you want to sell this picture uh, that's signed by Warhol. Like Warhol is still alive and he can sign the picture, right? So he's selling you this addition and then it goes for 50K, whatever. Now we are creating that concept for physical art, for masters that obviously they, they, they're not alive, but the collectors or the owners of the painting can serve as the signature. So you, are, you have the physical painting and you, you offer these digital NFTs that become the additions and the owner of the $100 million Picasso can sign these NFTs and say, yes, this is a real Picasso, this is a real Picasso. And then every NFT will link to the physical one. And you can create cool stuff around that physical painting. You, you can have artists creating these derivatives and, and, 
and creating these digital NFTs for, for the physical ones. So there's a, there's a cool play there in the concept of additions that, that, I, that I think we, we found some, some, some product market fit there. Um, on, the, on the ownership and, and, the, and how you actually can, can sell one, one piece into multiple pieces, we really didn't get into, into that yet. I think it's an interesting concept we first wanted to address this need of actually owning something digital and then looking at the different opportunities that you have to fractionalize it um, and provide uh, access for, for a lot of people, right? Yeah, I think that's so interesting when you talk about as soon as you digitize an asset, there's a lot more you can do with it, right? You could uh, you know, add extra stuff, um, to the even like a smart contract that is connected to the, this, if the 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 pieces on the blockchain, uh, for example, with digitized assets and and game developers, a lot of the conversation around NFTs is how to kind of program these digital assets to follow certain rules every time it's sold. So artists can you know continue to make uh, percentages every time their piece is sold. Um, maybe they even want to uh, donate to a charity every time you spend ten thousand dollars on this contemporary artist's work every time it gets sold, a little bit goes back to the artist, a little bit goes to charity, things like that. So I think it's really exciting. And also from the digital to the physical world, right? Um, we are looking at, Again, coming back to the fashion world, you have an opportunity to create digital NFTs. Like let's say we're working with a couple of brands and what we are proposing is, why don't you create these NFTs that represent designs for maybe uh, dresses or, or different items? And then you issue those as NFTs. People will be able to, um, to, buy, uh, to buy this. And then at some point you'll get instant real-time uh, data of uh, if designs are, are something that people like, and then maybe that will give them access to actually buy the physical ones when they release them. So there's a lot of different dynamics that, that I think it's, it's, it's great when you try to combine this virtual to, uh, to physical. Yeah, absolutely. And one more aspect about all of this that I would like to touch on is, uh, you know, Suku is, considering themselves the future of supply chains, right? And I think for a lot of people, they're becoming more used to this idea of traceability and, and tracking things. Um, again, for anyone just tuning in, this is Reimagine 2021, our virtual blockchain conference series. And on our YouTube channel, go check it out, subscribe. We've interviewed people like AB and Bev, uh, the largest beverage distributor in the world, uh, you know, Budweiser, all the, the beer, soft drinks. Um, and they have a like seed to sip traceability program. And they're kind of investigating how to put that on the blockchain. Do consumers want to know this information? And, uh, you know, you go to Starbucks and you see that this is supposedly fair trade. Maybe I can scan a QR code and find out where those beans came from. I think people are thinking more about, uh, being able to really track where their goods are coming from. Um, I would just love to hear more about it, the consumer demand for that in the luxury goods space, um, what you're seeing and how Suku is able to use that part of uh, blockchain for, for, for the both, both, right? We're talking about authentication, but also like tracking and tracing. Yeah, yeah. So those, those are, as you say, are well connected. And that's why we, we have these two parts of the business, which is like Omni is the traceability part and Infinite is the authenticity part. At some point, those come together because brands want to be able to address both issues. Like, how do I prove that this is an authentic item? But also, how do I prove that my item is sustainable um, and how that's important for conscious customers? So really... It comes down to sometimes we, we go with those solutions together. Sometimes it depends on which group you are, you're talking to. Um, but it's really the, the basis of everything. Um, from a carbon footprint perspective, from proving claims, we proved that our technology helps brands better connect with this new group of conscious customers. 
And it's not just a beautiful story of transparency. It's a story of real numbers. Like we prove that um, by using our technology, they can actually increase their market and, and expand sales because now they can talk to a new customers that they weren't, they weren't able to talk to. Um, and, and mainly these are consumers that really don't trust uh, what the brands are saying. Uh, there's a huge lack of verification. So, so you will have a brand that will start with that and say, hey, I'm interested in the track and trace because I want to create this story for, uh, for my products. Um, and then when you go through the authenticity, it's also about a story. Um, it's, it's a story about the ownership history, like through our um, technology, we were able to create the collectibles out of things that weren't collectibles. If you have a shoe, and this is something that we're doing, like if you have a shoe that was used by an NBA player on court, and then you can prove that they were the owners, you immediately create a collectible. What people are buying, it's not just the fact that now it becomes a collectible because he used it, they're buying the story, right? And, and the story is what connects you to the brand, connects you to the creator. And that's the same thing that digital artists are, are, are selling today. What um, captures the attention is being able to be part of that story. So it's whether it is from a sustainability standpoint where you are helping someone in the supply chain, uh, where you get to know them, where you're part of the community that's building that, or whether it is like being creative and trying to create a story on how they came up with the ideas and how they create communities around the product. So really both things are interconnected and some brands are usually trying to address both, but sometimes really going step by step uh, on what, what are the priorities, right? Yeah, I think you're so right about, uh, you know, as we become increasingly living in this digital world, um, we have more ways to attach value to digital objects. Um, this new class of consumers that you have to do more than just like sell an item, right? You're selling a story. You want someone to feel a part of something and they are looking for like an experience to kind of have this like uh, experiential engagement with the brands or the, their purchase and, and tie some emotion to that. Um, any, any good examples of a industry or object that has uh, really done well uh, trying to build that story around the traceability from, you know, like from seed to sip for, for a beer company or something like that. Yeah, there's a lot. We, we are doing, mm -hmm. um, we are, we have, um, we have many clients that go from the food industry uh, to fashion. We are tracking uh, swim shorts in different uh, locations. They start in Pakistan and they go to France. Um, we have a lot of different opportunity we're doing another opportunity with uh pajamas and they have like multiple factories and the idea is always to create a story from the artisan and the art these artisans are in congo right and and the goal for us was to help them somehow with every single time that they provide us uh data we will give them an incentive and really you create that sustainability story we we have a lot of those those use cases and we're proud of that because we you can see the impact that what motivates you is being able to, first of all, help the, the brand and, and the customer to, to sell more and to communicate that story to someone, but also being able to see the impact in the, in the smallest in the chain. Those are the ones that receive the least value. We've seen it over and over with fast fashion and, and, and difficult situations with, with suppliers. And, and really, it's all about upping their game, right? We, we are doing all this to, at some point, the brand will say, we need to up our game. It's like, we need to report all this. We need to be more sustainable. We need to be organic, but for the reason that at one point it's going to be on um, pilot, pilot mode where you can actually just, you are doing this because you think it's the right thing. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of, of cases in, in the market, but the ones that are um, most interesting is where, when you can actually see the end, we can see the first person that was able to do because that's the one that you're impacting the, the most. Absolutely. What would you consider the food item uh, an analogous to like sneakers? Uh, I think people are pretty familiar with uh, sneaker heads and how expensive some of them can get and how collectible they are. 
is there a food item that people are that kind of passionate about authenticating and knowing they have the right thing and, and maybe even selling it? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, from an authentication perspective, food item, I guess it's like the high value price items like caviar and salmon and fish across the board. Yeah. I don't think, I don't, I don't think, I mean, yes, like there's a, there's a significant issue from an authentication perspective. Um, but I think the component that those don't have usually is the reselling aspect. It's not like mm-hmm. I'm going to buy a salmon. <laughs> I want to, I want to check one time if the salmon is authentic or not, but I'm probably not going to resell it to someone and right. I'm not going to keep it forever <laughs> and then resell it over and over. So I think the reselling component is key because you are doing authentication every single time with, yeah. with the food products, you just do it once. So the, the problem, I think it's easier to resolve in some instances um, so I think that iteration is what makes it uh, difficult. But yeah, I would say fish. Um, I, I yeah. thought caviar might be caviar, one of those, yeah, caviar, yeah, caviar, there's all yeah. sorts of in- imitations and yeah. Um, we, well, we, the, didn't the, a, we didn't do that one. That's an interesting one. <laughs> NFTs for food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that answer. Um, so then, I think the last kind of part to talk about, um, which make it a little technical, so. Uh, I think a lot of people are tuning in who don't know anything about blockchain, uh, have heard about this crazy NFT thing. Uh, You know, I've been in the blockchain space for almost four years now, and now I'm seeing like musicians that I've known for a decade who I never thought I would be able to talk about blockchain or crypto with saying they're going to release their albums as NFTs. So um, how is your, how is Suku interacting with the blockchain? What protocol are you building on? And in layman's terms, can you kind of explain what's going on there and why are you using blockchain? Yeah, I mean, if you if you take a look at the transparency solution, you need to put all those pieces together, like all these participants adding data. So something in the middle that really links them all made sense. Something that nobody has control made sense. And uh, we thought blockchain at that point did make sense to 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 serve us as the as a ledger that can govern all these parties and 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 connect them all from uh, from an authenticity perspective also because you are creating these digital titles and authenticity is is everything and and so if you if you can actually check let's say um, this is an example that I always give let's say uh, Warhol is still alive and Warhol doesn't have any canvas. Uh, and so he, he invites you and say, hey, Ashley, I'm going to paint, paint this for you, but I only have like PowerPoint and paint and Photoshop. And then he paints these Campbell Soups um, uh, pieces, and then he gives you one, one of those to you. And so you are excited. Like, again, there's no canvas. There's nothing. There's just a, just a computer and Warhol is the first time that he's creating something. And then you go uh, to a dinner with friends and then um, you have the Warhol painting in your phone, right? And then you have four other friends and they say, hey, you know what? I have a Warhol painting with me. You say, well, which one? Uh, a Campbell soup, right? And then they all show their phones together. So you know, the, you know the other four are not real. You were just with Warhol at his home and he sent it the painting as a gift to you. He transferred the ownership to you and immediately in one second you can verify which one is fake or not. And I think that's the beauty of um, NFTs. That's, that's the, the beauty of authentication, instant authentication uh, that can be proven and, and cannot be corrupted. And I think the, the ownership aspect of that is, is that is what's enabling all these different um, dynamics within, within the market. Um, I think I think that's possible because because of blockchain because you can actually create an immutable record of ownership that you can track over and over, and you can verify if something is true without the need of trusting anyone. Um, we are we've been using Ethereum since 2017. Uh, at that moment, like there was pretty much nothing online that really worked in production. At one point last year. It was it was unusual for us. Like we we need to to spend a lot of fees. Mm-hmm. It wasn't scalable. And yeah, we we all love Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum is a big part of why we're here. But at some point, we needed to work. Like we needed these brands to to work and 
and we prioritize the short-term aspect of, of that problem that we face with a long-term uh, solution. We decided to migrate many of our platforms to Hedera Hashgraph that gave us lower fees, uh, scalability, and a good governance model with enterprises. So as we were connecting and we're selling to enterprises, it was important for us that the, the network was governed by enterprises such as Google, IBM, and other mm -hmm. big companies. Um, so yeah, we migrated a lot of different platforms to, to Hedera now. NFTs are on, on Hedera as well. For, for someone, and I think that was part of the, the question that you asked, for someone that, that's starting today, my first recommendation would be do not try to disrupt anything. Like there's no disruption like that, that just that just a dream that new entrepreneurs i think in my vision have i think the the whole idea is to fix one problem and a very small one and and try to iterate on that and if you're getting into the space there are a lot of cool stuff to go in it's overwhelming the type of opportunities and the fomo you will get by not doing one or the other but i think it's important to start very very small solving one piece and then iterating on that. So the disruption will come at some point, uh, but that will be- uh, <laughs> Everyone I, wants I to be the next yeah. Uber. I'm going to disrupt yeah. uh, supply chain. It's like, there's so many people working on that problem. Like, yeah, you need to get really specific. Um, you know, all these entrepreneurs who accidentally invent the post office or public transit because <laughs> they're trying to solve something that's not actually a problem uh, or in a way that doesn't actually make sense for consumers. I think- we see that sometimes in blockchain, people are just so excited about their technology, you just want to throw blockchain at everything because um, it's because it's so interesting and new without really thinking about how is this, what's the value add to an actual customer um, and do does it, does it need to have blockchain? And if it does, does the customer, how much does the customer actually need to even see that part of it? Um, I think the most important thing is that they see that they're, they're having a problem solved or, or getting some sort of value. Uh, from whatever technology you're using. Uh, so for traceability, authentication, blockchain is kind of an obvious um, uh, value add when you talk about being decentralized. So, you know, for example, eBay, if they have this authentication store, you're sending your stuff to them. They have some database. That database can be hacked. eBay could decide one day, we're going to sell a couple few fake ones, you know, to, to make some money. And that's, you know, kind of this blockchain revolution is not having everything centralized where there's a single point of failure, right? You have all of these different uh, computers verifying these transactions and, and reaching a consensus to prove that this item was actually sold to this person. And then with the immutability of the record, um, you can see every step along the way, who's owned what. Um, and so that kind of brings me back to this marketplace that you're building, where because all of the transactions are on the blockchain, they're associated with the person who owns the sneaker, for example, and anybody can maybe ping that person. Uh, perhaps maybe they opt in to be contacted, but I'd, I'd like to hear how, how you, how it currently works and how you envision it working. Um, that because there's this immutable, transparent record, uh, everything's basically kind of for sale and you can get contacted if it's the price is right, or if you opt in, how, how is that working now? And how do you see it working in the future? Yeah. I mean, right now it's, um, you could be as anonymous as, as you want to be. You can just have your wallet ID and then people might reach out to you. You can turn off notifications or yeah, you can be up for receiving whatever offer that, that you want. Um, I think the, the problem that we see with different marketplaces around the NFT space is that it's difficult to navigate them and it's difficult to get stuff that you like. And so we're trying to elevate that experience with uh, products that we think people want that are more exclusive um, or limited that you don't need to navigate all this. So it's it's pretty easy to, um, to, to become a seller or to become a buyer and finding things that you want to buy and finding um, buyers that want to buy the things that you have. Um, and so, yeah, it, it has different, different flavors, but, but really they can, they can reach out to you either through your, through your app um, or through the, through the site as an email. So yeah, it has different variations on how, how that can happen. 
Oh, great. Yeah. I definitely felt overwhelmed, uh, kind of trying to peruse some of these different, especially if it's just purely digital art and there's just, it's just so much easier to create and duplicate and, and distribute digital art, uh, kind of trying to navigate these sites and think like, do I want to buy something just to have? It's kind of fun. I, you know, I, I minted an NFT the other day on, uh, the Tezos blockchain, you know, just kind of trying to experiment. But I think for people just, uh, getting into this, might feel overwhelmed. What do you think the future of like digital art looks like? Is there, uh, th do you think that there's platforms that will kind of rise above and end up being like curators? I think personally, like I would be more likely to buy an NFT if it was associated with a brand that I already had some sort of relationship with, or maybe even um, a celebrity or a, a artist or musician or, or writer that I'm already kind of following. Uh, what do you see? Uh, what, what you, What's your vision for the future yeah. of NFTs? Yeah, I, I think there are two different uh, weird challenging experience that you face today on those marketplaces that we're trying to, to address. One is as an artist, you say, hey, I have this idea and I want to do this, um, but I don't know where to start, right? I don't know how these graphic solutions work or I don't know how to go from what I painted on that wall <clears throat> to what I want to do in, in the digital world. And so they get lost and then they, they launch NFTs and they, those don't get sold, but basically they, they, they didn't receive any help. Um, and the other, the other aspect is finding um, a way on, um, on really creating the stories, right? Um, for you to, to curate, to create the assets, I think, Marketplace could, could be doing a, a better job in communicating the story of these people and these artists. Like, it's not like you're just buying what you're seeing, right? I think what you're buying, again, I think is a story. So if you had a different way to first curate those to, I mean, yeah, to find some cool things instead of like just people um, going on the, the, themselves and trying to see if something is authentic or not. So that's another thing that you will you will encounter in different marketplaces so you're, you don't know if you're buying something from the original creator or not. but really is creating that story and being able to communicate that story because you're buying that as well um and mm -hmm. so i think those those are things that small changes that marketplaces can apply will definitely will be applying those um in order to create those, those stories that we think are so important into 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 nfts and 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 really we are addressing the collectibles space this is just the surface um and and some people might say that this is a huge bubble from a collectible standpoint it, it might be accurate in in many different cases but what's not a bubble is what nfts are going to create from a utility perspective right either from a gaming perspective or from creating value to the physical world there are a lot of different instances where nfts are the solution uh, and not just a collectible standpoint where, yeah, this, those might go down in value as the demand dries up. But really, I think those are, I mean, they are here to stay and, and the winners are going to be the ones that really find those utilities and different use cases and verticals. Yeah, and, and who are good at telling the stories and, and creating experiences for people. Um, well, just to wrap up for anyone tuning in, uh, this is Reimagine 2021, our virtual blockchain conference series. We are talking about the state of the art chain, all of the fun, the crazy use cases for blockchain that you may have heard celebrities talk about recently or your favorite rapper, uh, music, gaming, uh, art. Um, so just a fun question for Jonathan. This is Jonathan Lapchik from Suku. Uh, they are a marketplace for, or they are, they're, they're connecting the digital world to the physical world, RFID tags, being able to track and trace your authentic luxury goods. Uh, Jonathan, who is one of your favorite artists, living or dead? Uh, graphic artist, painter, sculptor, anything? Biggest artist. Um, I like I like Basquiat a lot. I really like Basquiat. I, I um, besides the the paintings, I was able to to learn from from a friend. Um, I love the, the story about it. Like I love learning about like every painting has a different context 
in his life. And, and you can see the connection between um, what he was facing at the time with how he communicated that on a painting. And that's, that, that's, that's, that's all like, that's, that's really what, what you're buying. Like you're buying the, the art, but you're buying the, the artist and, and that connection that you have with, with him through what he was feeling at times. Yeah. I really like, I really like Vasquez. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, and thank you for joining us for Reimagine 2021 State of the Art Chain. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers.